Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast, episode number 103, to Neil Brown, the content of our characters. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Tennille Brown. Tennille is professor of law at the University of Utah's Quinney College of Law, where she is also affiliated with the Medical School's Program for Medical Ethics and Humanities. Tennille teaches evidence and torts, as well as health law and bioethics, and her research is at the intersection of law ethics, and the biomedical sciences. Our podcast today features Tennille's new article, The Content of Our Characters. In it, Tennille takes a hard look at the character evidence rules, using recent psychological research as a lens. She asks hard questions, such as, how do people in everyday life think about character evidence? And are those moves or inferences justified? More importantly for us, Tennille asks what this empirical information means for the character evidence rules. As we've seen over the years on Excited Utterance, Rule 404 is a source of much persistent academic debate and confusion in practice. Tennille suggests that perhaps Rule 404 should be reformed in light of what we now know from social science. Tennille proposes an intriguing reform, one that combines the old with the new. Old because it turns out to look a whole lot more like the common law rather than the more modern federal rules. New because rather than relying on traditional folk wisdom, it relies on modern scientific evidence. Whether you like them or hate them, I suspect that what Tennille has to say will leave you thinking very differently about the character rules. Tennille, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Thank you so much. This is going to be fun. Your article is jam-packed with what I thought to be fascinating psychological and neuroscience data on how people reason about character traits. So let me begin there. Putting aside the legal system and the rules of evidence for the moment. How do people reason about character? Yeah, that's a great question. So it turns out that some of it is very deliberative and some of it is very subconscious and spontaneous and may not be subjected to reason at all. So some of our thinking about character happens so quickly that it happens without our conscious access to it. So within about 0.1 seconds of meeting someone, we've already drawn character inferences based on the way they look, the way they're dressed, how far apart their eyes are, how broad their chin is, things like that. So I would say that's probably uh, not even something that we're reasoning through. It's just implicit and automatic. What you're saying is that it's a very natural thing to do, that we all engage in character or character inferences every day, however it is that we meet people. All the time. That's right. Is there any empirical justification for doing this? Justification for doing it? Well, I think historically there probably was. There was probably some value to being able to quickly sort people into those we thought we could trust and those who we thought maybe we couldn't trust. Uh, Even though today, obviously, these inferences are not based in any kind of empirical data. It's not the case that someone who has a wider ridge on their forehead or who has maybe eyebrows that are a little thicker and point down, that those are people who are more likely to deceive us. And so there's no link between the facial characteristics and any sort of uh, character inferences that we might draw. But if you think, you know, thousands of years ago, more primitive times, they may have served some purpose to differentiate between ethnic or racial groups. They've long outlived their purpose. They're still with us, deeply, deeply ingrained, such that we don't realize we're even doing these things. But I don't think that there's a current justification for it, even if there was some time ago. But what about the more nuanced use of character? So someone looks at a person's past behavior and makes inferences about whether they are likely to engage in similar behavior next time. Yeah. 
we wouldn't have empirical justification for the appearance piece, perhaps, but at least the behavioral piece. Yeah, totally. So I think you're right. As between like judging people for their looks versus judging them for their behavior, there absolutely is a link. Sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's weaker between how people have behaved in the past and how they're likely to behave in the future. 30 years ago, people started talking about this distinction between the situation and their disposition and what is more predictive of how people are likely to behave in the future. And the truth is both are very important. So both how someone behaves in the past based on the environment, based on their history, is also going to be guided by their personality, their disposition, their kind of fixed character traits. And it really depends on the kind of behavior we're talking about as to whether or not past behavior is super predictive of future behavior. But there are certainly things like, and there have even been studies into this, people who have stolen when they were given the opportunity to steal, say like stealing exam results or stealing change out of a tip jar, they're likely to do that again if presented with the same opportunity. And so it's not the case that past actions are never predictive. It really depends on the kind of past action we're talking about and how controlled the environment of the situation is in the second instance. So my understanding, certainly before reading your paper about this literature about situational context, was that the changes were so hard to predict and so extreme, so small changes in context could result in completely different behavioral responses that yeah. effectively none of this character type evidence is probative. Is that not true? I don't think that is true. I think that it's funny because character evidence historically was rejected because it was both too probative and not probative enough. So there's kind of two sides of the same coin where people were arguing there's no probative value for character evidence because people change, situations change. Understandably, we don't want people to be punished for what they did in the past. They should only be punished for what they're doing or what they're charged with doing today. But then on the flip side, you often hear arguments from judges and attorneys that it's actually the opposite, that character evidence is too probative. And sometimes it can be. Sometimes, you know, you think of those uh, lack of accident cases or those doctrine of chances cases where if someone or say a Bill Cosby case where someone has drugged and raped a woman, maybe or accused of doing that dozens and dozens of times, that is quite probative of whether or not they did it in this one case or whether they're arguing that this one woman made it up. So I think it really depends. It's really nuanced. I think sometimes the situation is just too wildly different that to say someone who did something like, maybe even something that would be a pretty horrendous crime, like a murder, they may not do that in another situation because it may have been completely about the context and the rage and the maybe there was some opportunity or something that really drove them to feel almost irrational in the moment, or maybe it was self-defense. But definitely you couldn't then infer from that that someone was murderous and was going to kill lots of other people. I think it really depends on the context. But if you are a psychopath and you are someone who really doesn't experience pain or empathy and you're killing animals as a young child, there is a pretty good, pretty, not, I mean, there's not like perfect predictive value, but it's much more likely and depending on the studies, somewhere between five and 10 times more likely that you're going to commit some serious violent acts when you're an adult. So there are some actions that I think are pretty predictive and predictive enough to be probative to be admitted in trial, and then other things that are probably much less probative. So it really depends on how they're being used and what the kind of cross-situational consistency there is between these kinds of acts. So I want to switch gears, and I'm just going sure. to put that on the shelf for a second, and we'll get back to that. I want to switch gears to the legal context. So we're all familiar with the character evidence rules, but you make a point of describing some specific aspects of those rules that might be troubling or at least confusing. So yeah. I'll give you a chance to talk about those problems. Yeah, so obviously, uh, depending on um, who you're asking, this is one of the most complicated evidence rules. And the reason for that is really 404B, which is the idea that you can use character evidence for a non-propensity purpose. One of my next projects is going to be empirically looking at whether that's possible, because as most judges and most people who've really taken a serious look at this know, 
jurors are using, quote, non-propensity evidence for propensity uses all the time. And the social psych data suggests that that's to be expected, that if you hear that someone is a drug user and they use heroin and you tell the jury, don't use that evidence to suggest they're a bad person or a substance abuser and that therefore they were likely to have used heroin on another occasion. Instead, use that evidence just to show motive to steal. The jury is automatically drawing a character of inference from that data. And so the social psych evidence isn't in legal context, but it shows that people automatically make these character inferences based on whatever information they have, which is either behavioral or maybe face traits. But whatever they have, they're going to be compiling a character inference because it is the chief way that we assess blame and responsibility for behavior. So I think that it's not just likely that jurors are drawing that inference. It's probably impossible for them not to. There's the problem of 404B and whether yeah. or not that line can hold. But then yeah. there's also the argument that you make that 404 itself is wildly overbroad and that that right. leads to other problems. So, so, so yes. say some more about that. Yeah. So I think for one thing, if you look at the premise of 404, which is that historically criminal defendants had due process rights and we didn't want them to be punished for things that they had done in the past, the rule is no longer defensible on those grounds because it applies to witnesses in civil cases, criminal cases. It applies to behavioral traits that are considered positive or maybe amoral. And that leads to tons of confusion because you see courts not even recognizing evidence as character evidence, because even though the rule is agnostic to morality, at least as it stands in the federal law and in almost every state, the way that it's conceived of or the way that most people think about it is that it's about bad character traits. But of course, the rule doesn't say bad character traits. There was an opportunity to include language keyed to morality, and the drafters of the federal rules in most states decided to reject that in favor of just all character evidence being prohibited unless one of the common law exceptions exist or one of the 412 sexual assault exceptions. So it's really broad. And so I don't think most attorneys or judges even appreciate how much of the evidence that they're hearing, in fact, is character evidence. And so in the rapid pace of trial, evidence is introduced about a witness's past behavior. The obvious use is to draw a character inference to say this is the kind of person who uh, was in the math club in high school and who was a very good citizen and always paid their taxes. All of those things, those are all character bits of evidence to draw an inference that this person is credible, trustworthy, a good citizen, and that would all be prohibited by 404A. And so it's not even recognized as character evidence as such until someone notices there's an opportunity for appeal. And because the rule is not permissive or discretionary, it is a mandatory ban on all character evidence unless one of the exceptions holds, then that's an opportunity for a reversal or in a criminal case, acquittal, if it was thought to be prejudicial. So I think that's why the rule is so often litigated is because people don't appreciate when character evidence is even triggered, when the rule is triggered, because so much evidence is technically character evidence. Your point, though, I think is also broader than that. So it's not just that it creates confusion in the courts, therefore there's a lot of inefficiency litigating it, but in right. fact that we can't hold this line with the jury at all. That the jury is going, even if you could prohibit all of this evidence and never show it to the jury, that the jury would do it anyway. Now, how does that argument work? So that argument works in a way that's, I think it's a little bit depressing <laughs> because historically uh, we like to think that the law punishes people for what they do. And I think that's probably normatively correct. We shouldn't be blaming people for the kinds of people that they are, we should be blaming them for what they did. And there's a lot of kind of moral philosophy that has surrounded that. I mean, it, some people adopt the consequentialist or utilitarian view, which is it should be all about the harms or the consequences. Other people like to think about obligations and rule-based norms like the deontology moral philosophers, which is then all about you need to conform to a certain morally acceptable type of conduct. But either way, it's about behavior and you get judged by the law based on your behavior. And whether or not that's normatively correct, and I think it probably is, descriptively, that is not how humans assess blame. Humans assess blame based on character. 
And there's lots of evidence to support this, that even if we would like to be the kinds of people who blame people for the things that they've done, in fact, we're actually amateur person blamers or what's been referred to as person-centered blame, that we blame people for their character, not for what they did. And I can give you some examples from some kind of interesting studies that support that. But really, we engage in person-centered blame. And this is something that judges do. It's something that juries do. It's something everybody does. What does that mean for the rules? If you prohibit all of this character evidence, but yet the jury yearns to make character determinations, what is the jury going to do? So the jury will automatically use whatever data inputs they have to draw character inferences so that they can blame people based on who they think they are rather than what they've done exclusively. So they will use things like how the witness presents themselves, the words they use. They'll use facial expressions, but they assume those facial expressions are fixed. So if someone has what is referred to as a, quote, resting bitch face and they're, they have downturned lips, they'll assume that that is somehow connected with the emotions that that person experiences kind of in the long term. Even if it's just a latent facial expression, we are drawing inferences about people's characters based on split second presentations of their face. So whether or not they have a downturned smile, whether or not they dress professionally, whether or not they're wearing pearls, whether or not they are a black person, whether or not they are someone who may be gender non-binary. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that jurors are drawing inferences on a kind of spectrum of traits based on these split-second spontaneous trait impressions. So the traits that are most often studied are things like trustworthiness, likability, morality, dominance. So do we think this is someone who has a lot of agency and who is capable of following through on their goals? Intelligence can be inferred from split second faces, exposure to faces. Even social class is something that we can infer immediately. And then we use those stereotypes about how warm someone is, how competent they are, how trustworthy they are, how intelligent they are to paint a picture of their character, which we then use to predict how we think they are likely to have behaved in the past or to behave in the future. So there's this real bi-directional link between mental states, behavior, and character inferences. So you, if you shield jurors from either the mental state information, like the person intended this, they're going to use what they know about that person or what they can see from that person to predict whether or not they did the thing that they're accused of. And if you tell them about past acts, they're going to immediately draw inferences about what kinds of mental states they thought they had based on the way the person presents themselves. And so this is the link between the two halves about the Rule 404 and this discussion about what people do every day with character right. evidence. That if right. you basically stop the jury from using this information in a controlled fashion, then they will go and use it in an uncontrolled fashion and perhaps use character evidence that is even less reliable than the stuff that you were trying to prevent in the first place. Absolutely. And so we're obviously very worried about criminal defendants, but there's also the concern from kind of a victim's rights perspective that people who have, if they have untrustworthy phases, then maybe even if they haven't done anything that is criminal or even against the law, just by looking at them, jurors will assume they must have done it because they have an untrustworthy face. So that's obviously a big concern. And so you might need to introduce bolstering character evidence before we would ever think this person's character has been technically attacked according to the rules of evidence. So I do worry a lot about this kind of unregulated evidence that doesn't ever get scrutinized under 404. But it also applies to witnesses and it applies to people with witnesses or victims who may have untrustworthy phases, as well as defendants who have trustworthy faces. And so people may be inclined to say, oh, this person probably didn't do what the prosecution is saying they did because they have a really trustworthy face. But they're not reasoning through it in that way. It is completely automatic and subconscious, which makes it very hard to mitigate because if something is happening on a level that you're not even consciously aware of, then and when you try to correct it with kind of deliberate jury instructions, it's probably not going to work. And we've seen one study that tried to do just that. And in fact, it did make it worse. It made people double down on their impressions that they'd drawn from people's faces. What's the way out? 
how do we deal with this overly broad 404 and yet in some ways control the way that character evidence is used? Unfortunately, there's not an easy way out to correct the bias. So normally when you hear jurors are engaged in this really kind of um, ubiquitous type of bias, the answer is not to throw your hands up in the air and just say, well, then let them continue to, to do this. Uh, but the problem is because this is so common and so spontaneous and automatic, I don't think it's possible to mitigate with deliberate instructions because the kinds of inferences that are being drawn and the kind of impressions that are being formed are happening based on so many different kinds of inputs. Like I said, you know, what the hair looks like, whether or not someone is has a stern looking face, whether or not they have a broad jawline, whether or not they have chubby cheeks, all of these things are feeding into our assessment of someone's character. And so it would be impossible to try to have a jury instruction for each of them. And then because it's happening subconsciously, I don't think those jury instructions would work. So I think the way out is to, instead of trying to limit the scope of character evidence, Assuming that people are focusing and jurors are focusing on behavioral traits, we need to recognize that jurors are making character inferences based on a whole range of data that is not regulated by 404. And in the absence of hearing about someone's past actions, jurors will use the much less reliable forms of evidence and totally crude proxies that come from our deep ancestral past. And so it would be better to admit more character evidence so that people who maybe haven't had their character technically attacked can present evidence about their good character to kind of compensate for that baseline deficit because they just have an untrustworthy looking face. So my proposal would be to admit many more forms of character evidence. And because we know that jurors are going to find immoral evidence to be much stickier, the social science and social psychology research definitely shows that when the evidence is negative and immoral, jurors are much more likely to think that it's more predictive of future behavior than maybe it even is. So I think we do want to set aside character evidence that's immoral and treat it differently. But my proposal would be to actually permit many forms of character evidence. If it's amoral or moral evidence, I think it should be admitted just subject to 403. And then if it is considered immoral character evidence, that speaks to some trait that may create stigma or some sort of social blame, then I think we want to give it some extra treatment and use something like the rule from 609, the reverse 403, to put the thumb on the scale and say, this could get in if it's much more probative than prejudicial. But just like the crim and falsi, old crim and falsi convictions, this really shouldn't be admitted all that often. So that, of course, brings up the old question of line drawing. And the line drawing here is about the difference between immoral and, say, amoral or moral. How do we determine that? I think that's the most difficult nut to crack for this project, at least for me. I know that in the United Kingdom, where they have they've revised their character evidence rules significantly to be much more in line with the kind of proposal I'm suggesting, which is to allow many more forms of character evidence as long as certain kind of justice concerns are met. But the term they use is reprehensible. So evidence of reprehensibility gets this extra scrutiny for admissibility. I chose immorality because the social psych research is keyed much more towards morality. Reprehensibility is a close kind of cousin to that. But I do think that's an area of the project that needs a lot more development because immorality can be defined in different ways. There is a typology of immorality, which is that it is something that is socially sanctioned. But then, of course, when you talk about line drawing, the question is, what percentage of the population needs to find that behavior to be immoral such that this kind of special scrutiny of the rule would apply? If it's something that a small subsect of a community thinks is immoral, like let's say tattoos, right? There's an interesting question even about whether tattoos are character evidence, which I don't think they are, but there are character inferences drawn from tattoos and some courts have said that they implicate 404. But let's say tattoos, you know, I don't think tattoos are reprehensible or immoral, but some people do. So how would you treat that under my proposed rule? I was suggesting something like any subsect, some significant subsect of the population that could be represented in the jury pool if they found it to be immoral. It doesn't need to be something that there is a consensus view on because if two or three members of the jury found that, say, let's say polyamorous sort of relationships, if they found them to be immoral, 
then they could be engaging in some of these attribution errors uh, that the 404 rule is designed to prevent. So I think that would trigger the kind of immorality threshold. But I think it's it is so much, it's such a loaded word, uh, and there's so many different ways of defining it. But I think I would probably err on the side of defining it a little more broadly to just say, if this is the kind of thing that a judge using a judge's common sense thinks could be described by a significant subsection of the population as immoral, then if it's a criminal defendant, we're going to have some special rules. And if it's not a criminal defendant, then we just, we're going to use that flip of 403. Final question for you. Sure. What's next for this project? I can see in many ways a book. Are there future directions that you're taking this work? There are a couple of directions. Like in many ways, this this project is like this turkey that I just keep carving up and it just keeps producing more turkey. <laughs> I think the next step for me is doing some empirical work with some social psychologists. There's a really amazing researcher here at the University of Utah named Jackie Chen, and she's engaged in this research of spontaneous trait inferences. And she's been doing a lot of work on race and ambiguity in race. And what's interesting is when people see faces that they can't quickly racially categorize, which is becoming so much more common as people are no longer, you know, white or black, but multiracial, biracial. When people see a face that they can't racially classify, what do they do in terms of these stereotypes? Do we, we know that people find white people to be more competent, black people tend to be considered less warm, less trustworthy just based on their faces. And so what do pe people do and also jurors possibly do when they encounter a face that they can't racially categorize. And what she found in her lab is that they don't draw any inferences about character because they're like stumped. So instead of trying to use, she was thinking maybe they'll use individual bits of data instead of using racial classifications, they'll use individual bits of data to try to figure out what kind of character this person has. And she found that in this preliminary study, they just don't engage with that at all because it's like, well, we couldn't apply our crude racial classification so we're just not going to engage. We're just not going to make any character inferences about this person. So we are going to be developing some online experiments to do mock jury studies to see. The first question is, in the absence of information about how someone has acted in the past, do facial traits carry too much weight? So are people using the facial traits to draw inferences about trustworthiness, um, intelligence, and are those inferences much stronger than when we allow character evidence to be heard? So that's the first question. And then the second one is how do jurors draw character inferences when they're confronted with people who don't meet kind of classic criteria for race or gender? I'm excited for that. Well, Tanil, thanks for taking the time to talk about the recent psychological literature on character and your proposal to reform the rule. Great having you on the show. Thanks so much, Ed. It's funny. In the first evidence exam that I ever gave, I asked my students about the paradox that the propensity rule presents. We make propensity judgments all the time. If I lend you $10 for lunch today and you don't pay me back, and then I lend you yet another $10 next week and you don't pay me back, on the third time, I start to have my doubts and I think rightfully so. Yet, in the legal system, this kind of reasoning is barred. Yes, as Tennille suggests, courts or jurors often find ways to get around the propensity rule. But as a matter of formal law, I'm not supposed to reason in this way. But why not? Classically, the answer has something to do with a blank slate for criminal defendants. But we impose this rule regardless of context, regardless of whether it is the defendant or not the defendant, and regardless of whether the character is good or bad. So it can't possibly be just about the blank slate. All of this is to say that perhaps Tennille is onto something. Perhaps in our quest to abstract the character rule, we've somehow lost our way and turned it into something that it was never meant to be. So maybe it's time to go back to the original principle and ban just claims of immoral character, or to take it one step further, just claims of immoral character of the defendant. 
It's certainly more intuitive, and at least as Tennille's work suggests, it may be more practical and defensible as an empirical matter. At the start of this season, Alex and I talked about the dream of a modernized, scientifically-based set of evidence rules. Tennille's paper certainly falls within that dream, and her work, as well as that of many others, seems to be slowly, but surely, moving us in that direction. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Grace DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Francesca Rutherford, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof.